Hello. So my name is Twyla Tardif, and I am the director of the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies. And I am very happy to welcome you today to our 11th and penultimate uh, presentation in our virtual LRCCS noon lecture series for winter term 2021. I am also delighted to introduce our speaker for today's talk. Uh, we will be having our final presentation next week, um, and that's on Tuesday, April 13th, and that will be given by S.E. Kyle, who is an assistant professor of Chinese literature at the University of Michigan, and uh, Professor Kyle will be speaking on the making of a medium borrowing views from painting and fiction in the early modern Chinese garden design. Um, today's talk is going to be given by uh, Professor Michael Hathaway, um, who received his PhD in anthropology from the University of Michigan in 2007. Shortly thereafter, he began teaching at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. And he is currently Associate Professor, Director of Simon Fraser's David Lamb Center for the Asia Pacific, and Editor-in-Chief of American Ethnologists, together with Stacey Pig. His award-winning first book, Environmental Winds, Making the Global in Southwest China, was published in 2013 by the University of California Press. One of the three core members of the Anthropological Collaborative, the Ma Tsutake World Research Group, he has led research in China on the social worlds made through the creation of the wild Matsutake mushroom economy. Anna Tsing's book, um, The Mushroom at the End of the World, was the first book in the trilogy, and um, Professor Hathaway has just completed the second volume. And in case you don't know what a Matsutake is, apparently behind me, um, I'm sure he will go into detail. Uh, there is uh, a young boy picking his first one. So today he will be speaking on the role of more than humans in making Chinese society and history, thinking with elephants and mushrooms. Please join me in welcoming him. And also remember that uh, you may type your questions for the speaker at any time during the talk into the Q&A box. And at the end of the talk, they will be moderated by either myself or our wonderful Ina Schlorf. And um, then Professor Hathaway will respond to your questions. So with no further ado, welcome. Great. Thanks so much for the invitation. And I'm really delighted to be back virtually in Ann Arbor today. I was thinking if I was in town, I would certainly get a, a meal at Zingerman soon after. I wanted to thank the Center for Chinese Studies for the invitation to speak to you today. And I was so glad to get the email invitation from Ina, who I knew back as a graduate student. And I also know that uh, Huatse Giao was involved in today's talk, so I'd like to thank him as well. Okay, let me get started. Let me, I'm gonna do the screen share with you. I have some slides for you. Let's see. Hmm. Okay. Let's see if this turns up. Just a moment. Does that work for you there? You see that? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. Yes. All right. We can see it. Thanks so much. All right, great. Okay, so um, as you can see, the title of my talk is The Role of More Than Humans in Making Chinese Society and History Thinking with Elephants and Mushrooms. And so Part of what motivates this whole talk is this move in the last few decades where scholars from a number of disciplines have been increasingly interested in moving beyond human-centered or anthropocentric studies. And what they do is they explore how other animals have played roles on their own terms in shaping larger social and historical outcomes. And at present, China studies scholars have just begun this work. And my talk mentions some of these efforts and introduces my own studies on how wild elephants, 
motivate and challenge international conservation efforts and how a wild mushroom is shaping the rural economy in Southwest China. And just let me say at the outset, it was far easier to get a sense of elephant agency than it was to imagine what fungal agency might be like. Okay. So the humanities and social sciences have been dominated historically by several qualities, such as a human-centered or anthropocentric perspective, as well as a belief in human exceptionalism. Such exceptionalism sees humans as the only animal that possesses agency or the only one with language, culture, or history. And as a result of these two qualities and informed by what is called resourcism, other organisms are often regarded as a resource, resource for humans or perhaps a threat to human endeavors. So I think that by looking seriously at the lives of other organisms, we can greatly enrich our understanding of how we exist as human subjects within a vast ecological realm. We can better understand how we live in the middle of diverse ecologies that are often ignored in other realms like academic scholarship, urban planning and everyday life. But as we see all around us, uh, there does seem to be a larger shift to becoming more aware of these situations. So my own work has been inspired uh, by a number of fields, including geography, history, and others. But within anthropology, the main one is what is often called multi-species ethnography. And so some of these scholars, such as the anthropologist Anna Singh, is arguing that human nature is an interspecies relationship. In other words, many see the contemporary human condition as a time in which we are alienated from our animal kin as wild and domestic animals have been pushed out of the urban environments that more than half of humans live in with a notable exception of our pets. And yet for millions of years, we have always been entangled in relations with these other animals as our prey and our predators, as landscape makers, as sources of physical disease and spiritual wonder, and much later in evolutionary time as domesticated animals like dogs, yaks, and laboratory rats. Recent studies of domestication, for example, are starting to reimagine these relations. They're challenging the older narrative that humans domesticated other animals as a form of one-way dominance. Instead, they look at the ways that domestication was a two-way street, requiring changes in human society and even increasing our susceptibility to the bi-directional flow of disease. Going beyond the animal, we now know that even our own bodies are made up of innumerable biota as we explore microbial worlds within us and upon us. And I would say that these new understandings are fascinating and have major implications. So first, I will just mention a few books that uh, informed my own studies of elephants. So in 2006, Mark Elvin wrote The Retreat of Elephants, an environmental history of China, which inspired me to think about the role of elephants in China's long durée. Elvin argues that elephants were basically incompatible with Chinese style agriculture. He describes how millennia ago, thousands of elephants roamed massive areas of China, as far north as Beijing, but lost ground until now just a few hundred exist in Xishuangbanna, a small peninsula of Chinese territory in Yunnan province that juts into upland Southeast Asia. Yet his account ends in the year 1800. And I thought, had he continued to explore the elephant's lives into the present and approached the topic informed by recent scholarship and animal studies, he might have seen something quite different. And I'll just say too, because I'm talking here for, uh, for Michigan folks, especially another inspiration for my work uh, was the historian at Michigan, Tom Troutman, who wrote this fascinating account of elephants in Indian history. And his earlier work was inspirational to mine. So in the last decade, a new generation of scholars in China studies are asking important questions about forms of non-human agency. I would include a recent PhD thesis by Peter Braden at UC San Diego entitled, Serve the People, Bovine Experiences in China's Civil War and Revolution, 1935 to 1961. 
Also a book by Lyle Fernley called Virulent Zones, Animal Disease and Global Health at China's Pandemic Epicenter that just came out last year. So talk about timing and several interesting studies on the role of pigs in Chinese society, including one by Sigrid Schmalzer, as well as a new co-authored piece in the Journal of Asian Studies that's quite fascinating. And I also wanted to mention, there's a notable recent paper on uh, uh, pikas, these small mammals that are critical to upland grassland ecologies. It was written by Emily Ye and Garang called Pest Keystone Species and Hungry Ghosts, the Gisar Epic and Human Pika Relations on the Tibetan Plateau. And their paper contributes to China studies with a deep engagement in how Han and Tibetans view pikas. With the prominent exception of Eric Mugler's work, there are relatively few serious studies of comparative ontological difference in contemporary China. It also challenges how range scientists have depicted pikas as pests and argues for their ecological importance as a keystone species, meaning a critically important one to the functioning of an ecosystem. Okay, so at this point, let's now shift gears from this whirlwind of scholarship to open up some of the new questions and concerns that are emerging from these studies. So this is one of the questions that I was asking. And I would say that in some ways, plants and animals have long been included in our studies. So these are not totally new subjects. I would say, however, that some of these studies present organisms as subjects in new ways. So in terms of plants in China, tea and rice depicted here have often been critical, but there has been relatively little work that looks at these organisms as lively actors, that looks at the roles of the tea plants themselves, of the rice plants themselves, and how they are part of these much wider ecologies of pests and predator disease landscape shaping and so forth. And so as geographer Sarah Watmore has argued, such work recognizes that not all actors are human and acknowledges the roles that non-humans play in social life where social life is construed more broadly than just humans. So in the time remaining, I will uh, briefly discuss two concepts, agency and what I call liveliness. And I would be happy to talk uh, more about these in the Q&A after the talk. So within the West, definitions of agency are often based on a notion of intentionality, which is often assumed to be a human only quality. And one approach on this question is to be agnostic to intentionality and to focus more on effect in the world. Yet even with this approach, there is a dominant tendency to look at individual actions and yet such individualistic approaches are challenging when one is trying to understand more diffuse events and historical shifts where we can't always uh, identify individual agents. So when I started to think about elephants and agency, I was first considering taking an individual approach. I contemplated going back to uh, Southern Yunnan to do more field work and to follow a single elephant, maybe as part of a herd, to document its life and to see how it engaged with villagers, rice fields, and dogs, among others. But after talking to a Chinese elephant biologist, I was quickly dissuaded of this possibility, who told me that such a project would be far too physically dangerous and difficult. And as I had had a few run ins with elephants during my time there, I I quickly realized he was right. So this led me to consider a different frame, what some scholars call cumulative agency, where agency is dispersed and distributed. I first heard about this concept from Jeremy Presthold, who was trying to understand how the colonization of Africa shaped England. Scholars like Ann Stoller showed how colonies like were, or, sorry, were, colonies were experimental testing grounds for new forms of governance that were eventually used in the metropole. But Prestholt was also interested in understanding other forms of co-constitution. He looked at trade, 
and how locally and ethically specific desires for certain kinds of trade goods, such as British made cloth and beads, shaped how regional economies within England rose and fell as they engaged with African-based desires. I began to apply this concept of cumulative agency to elephants. When the PRC began, leaders in Beijing did not know if there were any elephants left in China in 1949. It was likely that they were all gone, that they had retreated into neighboring Myanmar, Burma, Laos, and Vietnam. So as a thought experiment, I imagined how social life would have been different had elephants been totally gone from China, had they been extirpated. And this was a method to understand their cumulative agency to see how the remaining herds shaped the lives of villagers. So let me give you a brief description of what elephants did there. Somewhat surprisingly, they became protected by the state. And this seemed to contradict Mark Elvin's view on the history of elephants in China, that the Han Chinese conducted a quote, war against animals, especially elephants as a major agricultural pest. They would often enter rice paddies and consume or destroy substantial quantities of rice. And, and one thing I'll just mention too, when I was doing fieldwork, this happened a number of times. And at that time, I had the only uh, camera in the village. So I'd often go up to these fields and be asked to take the photos that villagers would use to uh, try to get compensation that I'll talk about in just a minute. And then after the government began to confiscate guns in the 1990s, villagers said that the elephants quickly learned that they were unarmed. So over uh, at least a decade, police were entering villages and taking these guns that were often homemade muzzle loaders, you know, with, you know, using black powder. They gathered tens of thousands of these guns, burned them in public bonfires reminiscent of the early earlier spectacular burnings of elephant ivory by the Kenyan government, or the later burning of wild animal pelts by Tibetans. Villagers told me that these confiscation campaigns were carried out in part to reduce hunting of different species, but mainly in terms of protecting elephants. In 1995, uh, when I was uh, in China for the first time, I saw that a group of elephant poachers were caught and some of them were executed which signaled this massive shift in government sensibility. As some villagers told me, caring more for wild animals than for people would have never happened during the rule of Mao Zedong. So, but people's relations with elephants were complicated. In some sense, villagers deeply feared the elephant's presence as in one night, the elephants could wipe out an entire year's crop. As much as the villagers resented the elephants, they also seemed amused and impressed by them. I expected that villagers would express more fear and anger toward a beast that threatened to kill or maim them or could destroy their entire crop in a single night. And yet I heard many stories about the ways that elephants were, were naughty, were hantiaopi, or clever, songming, the same terms used to describe well-loved and intelligent children. States became known as the, or elephants became known as the state's animals, where officials took a certain amount of responsibility for their actions, as well as for their protection. With this in mind, villagers could try to document their loss to the forestry department, something they enlisted me in, and the department could possibly compensate farmers for their loss. Yet even if they won, the rates of compensation were very low, not nearly enough to buy back the equivalent grain. The elephants were also frightening to people and to dogs. People talked about how elephants and dogs have a special antagonism. I heard about how dogs could sometimes surround an elephant until the elephant got angry and the dogs ran away. There are cases, however, when the dogs ran into someone's home, which was made of thin split bamboo and a thatch roof, and the elephant came in after it, destroying the house in search for the dog. But the continuing presence of wild elephants in China, the kind of small miracle that they remained after all those millennia, also attracted a long series of international conservation projects to the area, especially 
in the 1980s when China had very few international connections and was relatively poor, these well-funded conservation projects were of critical importance. In 1995, I worked at a university in Yunnan and there were only two cars, a Jeep and a VW Santana that were shared by at least 20,000 students and faculty. Yet I soon saw a third car which had the panda bear logo of the World Wildlife Fund or WWF. And I was surprised to learn that this third car was owned by just one family who got it through working for WWF. Now, as many of you know, this organization was first attracted to China to work with panda bears, but soon began to expand in Yunnan's tropical rainforest, mainly to protect, protect China's last herds of wild elephants. WWF helped design and fund China's first ecotourism project designed so that villagers, or visitors rather, could watch herds of wild elephants bathe in a river. They tried to protect villagers' crops from raiding elephants by stringing up powerful electric fences when the harvest was ready. I learned that such fences had a short lifespan and the elephants soon learn how to grass tree branches and bat down the electric wires. And when I talked to people about how these techniques were supposedly successful in Africa, I heard a kind of mixed affect. The fact that these fences, which seemed so powerful and modern, had not been able to protect their crops was a huge disappointment. Knowing that these elephants could defeat this technology, however, created a kind of pride. As some said, well, these are Chinese elephants and like the Chinese, they are clever. So later, other conservation oriented groups arrived from the Netherlands and Germany and conservation officials in, in Yunnan successfully applied for a major World Bank project and brought in unprecedented funding, which include highly coveted four wheel drive vehicles. And all of this international interest, it should be noted, came on the backs of elephants. So such global attention and funding was likely part of the reason why the Chinese state ended up taking a hard line on elephant conservation. Whereas in India, which also received a lot of international conservation support for their Asian elephant population, there was a regular program of hiring wildlife wardens in India to kill elephants known to kill people often labeled as rogue males. In China, such state sanctioned revenge was never allowed. Especially after the guns were confiscated, villagers talked about how elephants sought out their revenge on people who had harassed them for decades, who had shot at them and their elephant family, or who threw firecrackers and even dynamite at them during the harvest season. Some friends suggested that the state might be trying to suppress the news about how many times elephants actually attacked and killed people, and I eventually had reason to suspect that they may have been correct. I found a report by the Ministry of Forestry detailing elephant attacks. Um, it was something that was briefly online and then quickly disappeared, but I, I saved a copy of it. And I was amazed to see how many there were, especially for such a small group of elephants, estimated to be somewhere between 200 and 250. And what I read in the report was just over a five year period from 1997 to 2002, elephants in Yunnan had killed at least uh, 63 people, which I thought was a really high figure for such a few elephants. And then later I got uh, statistics from Southern India where they kept really good um, statistics and did really good research and found that in Southern India, there were about 7,000 elephants. And of all these elephants, about 40 people a year um, were uh, killed by elephants there. And so what I saw was that this was a really <laughs> incredibly uh, dangerous situation for people in, in Yunnan, but it is highly likely that um, many of the attacks were carried out by a handful of these rogue male elephants, which in India, of course, would have been targeted for killing. Thus in India, while the state is proud of its potentially growing elephant population and its no kill conservation policy, is now praised by um, different elephant advocacy groups around the world, there are problems brewing. And the situation of a now largely unarmed rural populace has created many changes in everyday life. 
It makes people afraid to travel at dawn and dusk in places where elephants are known to frequent. And people are starting to change their crops to those less desired by elephants. And all told, this is creating uh, yet another uh, force among many uh, that makes people uh, leave rural villages. So in some way you can think of the pull of the bright city lights and the push of the elephants um, that is helping to foster this movement, yet sometimes the elephants uh, even show up uh, in town. And yet, as I was studying this, I wanted to know more about the role of the elephants in a less human-centered way, such as how their own dietary uh, preferences for some wild plants and not others were shaping the local ecology. And how these kind, but these, I found that these kinds of studies were few and far in between. And this is one of the challenges for anthropologists or historians to study these multi-species entanglements as we increasingly rely on the studies made by biologists. And without the studies we need, we, it's something that we cannot undertake ourselves. So I'm hoping to kind of foster more forms of collaboration and, and something that I am really interested in in the future is to help train some Chinese graduate students in wildlife ecology that are working with elephants. And I'm hoping that they can uh, teach me more about how elephants are shaping these larger human and more than human worlds and that I may be able to contribute some of my own anthropological methods um, and teaching them to foster their skills, especially learning from rural villagers who hold much knowledge on changing elephant behaviors and activities. So in terms of my larger trajectory, my turn to the natural sciences was really boosted through my research project on the role of this one uh, wild mushroom that was mentioned earlier, the matsutake in Japanese, which also means pine mushroom or songrong in, in Mandarin. And I already knew that the high altitude uh, grasslands beyond Yunnan in places like Tibet and Sichuan and Qinghai were places rich in another kind of fungus. I had read studies by Kunga Lama and by Daniel Winkler who showed that for Tibetan pastoralists, this valuable fungus is critical to their economy. Um, I don't know if, if most of you know about this, but it's a fascinating uh, situation where this uh, fungus is able to take over this underground larvae. This is a caterpillar of a ghost uh, moth and it uh, makes it go up through the soil and then basically stop at this certain distance that you see here. And then the, the inside the fungal mass will grow through its body and then out through its, its head like that uh, grows the stalk of the fungus and then it will sporulate. So, you know, they're very hard to see, as you can imagine, this is this beautiful uh, side view by Daniel Winkler, but they're just these little uh, protuberances up there in the grasslands. Um, so in Latin, you see there, this is called cordyceps and this is known uh, in Tibetan as Dyartsa Gunbu, uh, which is translated into English as summer grass, winter worm, uh, as something that switches in these cycles. And the place where I was working was just to the south of this land of cordyceps, uh, where the Matsutake mushroom grows in the forest. So my work on the wild mushroom began as a study of its trade. In the mid 1980s, virtually overnight, this mushroom went from being something with almost no economic value. So here's a picture I took in an E village uh, outside of Chusheng in Nanhua. Uh, where this mushroom hunter, and he's a wonderful musician, is showing me how when he was a child, he would pick matsutake and pierce them with a stick like this. And right, right before he told me this, he was wincing just thinking about how he was selling these mushrooms soon to become so valuable, but at those days it was next to nothing. And he explained that for them, matsutake wasn't considered especially good. It was just something to throw into the pot. He said, if you had tofu, that was better than matsutake, but at least it was something to eat. But then in the mid 1980s, it started to become a valuable commodity after it was discovered by Japanese traders. And they fostered the trade in this mushroom, first shipping pickled mushrooms and, 
barrels by boat and then later fresh shipments by commercial plane. This trade, which now involves over 200,000 people who work during the fall feverishly every day, bringing these mushrooms out of the high mountains and into large commercial centers. And they send almost all of their larger mushrooms to Japan. In the villages where I study this trade with Tibetan and with E, I stayed in, uh, this is especially for the Tibetans, I stayed in large new homes built with the proceeds of this trade, what were called Matsutake mansions. Yet over the years of my research, I became increasingly fascinated by how this mushroom was much more than a commodity. I asked, what if I looked at Matsutake not only as a resource for human trade, but also at it as um, in the ways that it is a lively organism whose life mattered in and of itself. And yet getting back to the question of existing biological research, I could find almost no existing scientific work on the specific ecological roles played by Matsutake. So at this point, I broaden my studies to explore the role of the fungal kingdom writ large. So this journey uh, informed my book, which is forthcoming next year from Princeton University Press. It's tentatively titled uh, World Makers, How Rethinking Fungi Helps Reveal the Liveliness of All Living Beings. And I wrote this book for an audience with relatively little knowledge of our fungal cousins. Only recently have many people heard, for example, that fungi are more closely related to animals than to plants, even though mushrooms have for so long, especially in the West, been considered as a kind of strange plant. And so for the next few minutes, I'll provide a short introduction to this fungal realm, showing how its everyday actions help it negotiate the worlds it helps foster. In my analysis, looking at the physical properties and behaviors of each organism is one way to explore its liveliness, to see how its own temporal and spatial qualities create larger effects. Oh, and I just have one extra slide before I move on to you. This is um, uh, waiting for the, uh, the bosses, the, uh, the Matsutake dealers to show up. This is one of the uh, Tibetan villages where People, you know, you'll have well over 100 people will gather every day uh, to bring in their, their harvest. And they created this uh, circle of these different uh, small kind of huts all around where the dealers will come in and, and buy the day's harvest. Okay. So it turns out that uh, Matsutake are one of many what's called mycorrhizal relations in these forests. And here you can see this a chart that uh, a, a friend of mine had um, commissioned. You can see there are three kinds of, of categories of mushrooms, mycorrhizal, parasitic, and saprotrophic. And historically, it was thought that a mushroom was in only, a particular species was only in one category. So the uh, parasitic ones were, you know, obviously going, uh, eating living material, the saprotrophic, uh, mushrooms were eating dead material, usually dead trees, and the mycorrhizal ones were making these uh, relations with, with, living, with living plants. Um, but one thing he did in this chart is show this as a kind of continuum, and it turns out that through its lifetime, uh, uh, like a, a certain mushroom can uh, change its, its ways, of uh, ways of making a living. It can move sometimes from parasitic to mycorrhizal, for example, uh, which is a kind of recent discovery. So this term mycorrhizal is starting to be used beyond mycologists, mushroom scientists, um, but this is part of this new uh, understanding that we now know that about 90% of plants in the world are forming these mycorrhizal relations with underground fungi. And we're learning that such relations are totally critical to the web of life, to the flourishing of plants and fungi, and then by extension, animals and everything else. So these underground fungi are composed of often microscopic threads called hyphae, which collectively form a mycelium. And this structure can exist underground, connecting several kinds of trees. It's often depicted in this way of one mushroom in one tree, but these are, can be vast, vast collections. And they have been popularly known as the wood wide web 
and are usually regarded as a way that plants communicate through the medium of the fungal mycelium. Um, signals can travel through this network warning of increasing drought or insect attack, and trees are able to interpret these signals and make informed decisions. And, and I won't go into this now, but one thing I think the history of this has often been uh, kind of plant-centered where plants are just kind of using this web to communicate to themselves. But now I think there's interesting uh, awareness and studies of these kind of forms of fungal agency, how much, like where's the relative decision-making um, in, this, in this network? And it's starting to open up questions of the role of the, of the fungi itself. And so this network can be this vast underground structure, potentially knitting together uh, huge areas of forest. And sometimes it coordinates the timing of trees in the spring to leaf out or in the fall to drop their leaves. And scientists recently found that with the right equipment, they can see such uh, networks uh, from, uh, from overhead planes. They can see these relatively different uh, fungally linked networks. And when they go on the ground, they turn out to be in different kinds of, of networks. So getting back to Yunnan, Matsutake form relations with a few kind of trees. In Japan, where we know most about its ecology, it only forms partnerships with pine trees. Thus the Japanese name means pine mushroom. But in Yunnan, it also links up with oak trees, especially at higher elevations. And these mycelium of the Matsutake are excellent foragers. They're able to gather far more water and nutrients than tree roots alone can collect. Mycologists recently discovered <clears throat> that some mycelium have amazing abilities. They can drill into minerals and seem to be able to seek them out within the soil matrix. To understand these connections and to move beyond a strictly human-centered approach, my studies opened up time scales far beyond the short time frames that I normally investigate, like the last century or so. And instead to examine the history of Matsutake in Southwest China, I went back millions of years I looked at times before the Himalaya mountain range came into being. I followed the course of a separate te tectonic plate that carries present day India that sent it careening from below the equator to crashing into the Asian tectonic plate, creating an impact that is still ongoing. This rise in mountains created the higher elevations, created the Himalayas that these trees needed. And in turn, Matsutake's presence helped allow these forests to flourish. And over many millions of years, uh, Matsutake have expanded their range uh, around the entire planet. And here's one chart showing these kind of, uh, the, the science changes quite quickly, but you can see these kind of massive um, movements as uh, these, you know, what were three different species at the time as they uh, travel around the world. And this is one of the many, many examples of their own liveliness, their ability to produce these prodigious spores that are able to catch the wind and travel far distances. And you can think of other kinds of fungi like the underground truffle that uh, depend on other things other than wind. They're, they depend on attracting animals to dig them up, to eat them and transport them to new locations. So each species of fungi has their own ways of being, their own particular ways of growing, reproducing and interacting with other fungi, with animals and with plants. And coming back to the present, while the mycelium can survive for long periods of time underground, Matsutake hunters are only looking for the above ground mushrooms. Mushrooms are the fruiting body from the mycelium and for Matsutake, these only appear in the fall. The fall timing is important for all species in these regions. This is a time of harvest for crops such as barley up in the Tibetan areas. This is a time to be moving yaks from high mountain grazing pastures down to the village in preparation for winter. When a certain group of people decide to devote themselves to one species, whether it's um, Matsutake or yak or others, they have to consider all of the particulars of these different species in terms of time and space. And then this in turn has consequence for relations to other species. So there are always changes and sometimes there are conflicts. Some families had been debating about getting rid of their yak herds 
And these are complex decisions with all kinds of reasons. Some talked about declining quality of pasture and the new laws that made it illegal to maintain the grasslands using fire, but others were attracted by the potential profits of Matsutake. And so to think about these kind of questions of timing that are, that are something that emerges out of the lively properties of different organisms is an important aspect. But others knew that betting on Matsutake was never a sure bet. The perfect conditions to trigger a massive fruiting of mushrooms are elusive even to scientists that have studied them for decades. In part, the right timing and intensity of rains are required as well as change in cooler temperatures. And every year, the levels of harvest are unpredictable. They are part of the lively qualities of this mushroom that far exceed the limit of human management. And I find it fascinating that although many millions of dollars have been invested by some of the world's top mycologists, so far, the Matsutake has totally resisted being cultivated. Now, this is such a valuable market, and it sometimes reaches about $5 billion a year. So the temptation to cultivate it is strong, and attempts are ongoing, but so far, they have always ended in failure. So they realize that Matsutake's needs are complex. Although the value of Matsutake rises and falls with incredible speed, high one season and low the next, Still, these mushrooms generate lots of interest for those in rural China who live in the prime habitats. In some villages, everyone from 8 to 80 walks up into the hills to pick the mushrooms every morning during the season. In other places, people travel to favorite mountains to set up camps to pick Matsutake. Yet, no matter where they are, everyone needs to bring them fresh to dealers who hike them down to the nearest road where they in turn go on to the next dealer and the next all the way down to the provincial capital. The Japanese markets demand the mushrooms fresh, usually on the plate of consumers within 48 hours after picking them from their own wood wide web. Whereas other mushrooms like the porcini, the bovite, or the chanterelle can be dried and they can be stored for long periods of time, the mandate for fresh matsutake means the commodity chain is extremely rapid and they rarely sit still. So in sum for my talk today, Matsutake and elephants have taught me a lot about how to consider agency and liveliness among non-humans. It was far easier to understand agency in the actions of an individual elephant and especially in comparison to an individual mushroom. When I first started to look at what mushrooms did, I didn't even think they really had any agency at all. They didn't appear to really be doing anything other than exist as a meal for insects or humans. But Matsutake is now often described as Yunnan's most valuable, most important agricultural export. But in thinking about it, it is hardly agricultural. It cannot be planted and the conditions that cause it to flourish remain somewhat mysterious. As I studied their lives, I found that fungi were absolutely critical to the health of the forest. As China carries out new conservation programs that preserve forests, the Department of Forestry is realizing the value of Matsutake is often worth more than the standing timber. These two species, Matsutake and elephants, are part of new po political economies. As global conservation interests intersect with long-standing rural development policies in China, creating new opportunities and challenges for many. I hope I provided a glimpse at how these more than human worlds might be shaping social landscapes that include humans, but are not only about humans. So thank you very much. Wow, <laughs> my world has been changed. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> my mind is spinning. That is incredible. Um, thank you, uh, Michael. Um, I, I'm gonna have to, look at the world in a whole different way now. Um, so I will start the questions um, and I think I'm going to hand off uh, the questions if Fina's ready um, after this first one. Um, so the first one is, um, uh, says just today, I read an article by Katie Soper who argues that the concept of human exceptionalism is needed and this is so so appropriate to my reaction here too in order to philosophically support the role that humans play in creating and potentially preventing ecological disaster i was wondering um if 
the concept of human exceptionalism needs to necessarily translate to seeing animals as resources or threats. So I guess that's a big philosophy, yeah. big picture question for you. Right. Now that and that's a that's a great picture or great question for us to really be thinking about, like in terms of the big picture. Um, and two, it raises some interesting uh, points about what happens if we um, if we want to challenge human exceptionalism. Does this kind of let us off the hook in certain ways for climate change? I mean, that's kind of part, or like this kind of like larger sense of kind of global responsibility for this kind of planetary mess that can certainly be argued is, you know, you know, brought on by, by, by human uh, actions and aspirations. I mean, I, I think that's, that's right, that you, uh, it's not necessarily an either or. Uh, it's not uh, that if you um, take away human exceptionalism, you inherently get uh, this other form of resourcism. There are many ways I think of of being in the world uh, that are possible. I I think that um, though in terms of of climate change and uh, what these kind of human responsibilities are, I think that human exceptionalism, where we've kind of built all the kind of questions of the economy based on what are the impacts to human lives, to human health, uh, to human profits are a major part of the kind of conundrum that we are in now. And it may not be necessarily that uh, just like eliminating human exceptionalism and trying to think of all of all species as having kind of equal capacity. I don't, I don't see that necessarily being a fruitful way uh, forward either. But what I was thinking is more that the ways that you can understand what are each, what are the actions of each of each different species and its own implications. So I certainly think that humans carry uh, like a huge history, uh, a huge set of responsibilities based on that history, that ongoing um, creation. So I don't, I don't think, yeah, necessarily one has to throw out the baby with with the bathwater there. And it's certainly, and I don't think people are really arguing for a kind of like um, kind of like radical uh, equality between all species. And uh, just the last thing I'll say on that is, is part of it is um, I think too, some people are leery around this concept of, of agency, especially where it becomes just kind of um, everything, like that all, that all, all beings have uh, similar kinds of agency. And so that's uh, something that you see oftentimes in different theoretical perspectives. Um, like actor network theory. And so that is uh, a framework in which all kind of living beings and even non-living beings um, that become connected to this network uh, are an actant. And in that way, they all seem to be kind of equally um, influential or equally important. And I feel like that way of kind of dissolving uh, agency uh, and that way doesn't really help us to understand the specifics and the real substantial differences between uh, these, different, uh, these different organisms. Okay. Thank you. So um, I'm gonna read the next question. Unfortunately, Twyla had another commitment. So okay. Thomas Wagner has actually asked several questions. Are Chinese elephants seriously protected by the government from ivory hunters? Huh. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, back in, um, in 1995, the uh, poachers that were caught and uh, killed, in part, they were going after uh, the ivory. Uh, as, you, as most people probably know, the, uh, the tusks on the Asian elephants are far, far smaller than the African elephants. So uh, like the the value of the tusks um, is uh, much smaller based on the number, you know, the poundage really of the ivory. Also, we've seen that uh, it's probably been a selective pressure that human hunting uh, 
on Asian elephants has selectively targeted the ones with, with bigger tusks over time so that they have in part shrunk in relationship to this human hunting pressure over uh, many millennia. That's something that uh, scientists um, have thought. But it seems to be uh, relatively low, the amount of um, kind of ivory-based poaching. And that's, I gave a talk somewhere else where it's an interesting kind of conundrum where you know, you have the protection of these Asian elephants uh, in terms of ivory, that's pretty, a pretty strong protection. But then on the other hand, when you, when you try to figure out the global picture and what is the relative role of like, say the wealthy uh, in China in terms of ivory of other elephants, um, that's a whole nother picture. And so, but even alongside that, you see the rise of, um, of different animal rights activists or even different Chinese celebrities who are trying to uh, push against the, uh, the desire among uh, you know, wealthy Chinese for, um, for ivory. And you know, I also just make the point too that just in terms of the longer world history, that there's just, the, the West just had huge desire for uh, ivory that just goes way back. And so that, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of elephants were killed historically for uh, making uh, pool tables or for the pool balls, the billiard balls and for piano keys. So what we see are like different uh, forms of ivory desire that change over time based on different people and things. <clears throat> I'm going to re re reiterate this point that we would prefer that if you have questions to please type them into the Q&A. It's just a little harder for us to, to go back and forth from chat. Mm -hmm. um, so the next question, also from Thomas Wagner, are some wild animal, sorry, are some wild elephants fatalities caused by timid herds blundering through temporary jungle camps and gatherings in Malay we would keep them away at night by shooting off firecrackers. Mm. Sorry, are they are they hurt by by going through camps? By blundering, <laughs> like <laughs> like that. It's not like a direct attack. Right, it's they right. blunder into jungle camps and and inadvertently cause damage. Oh yeah, that's certainly that is certainly true. That that does that does happen. Um, and certainly, yeah, it's an interesting thing, right? And I was trying to develop a kind of, figure out a kind of parallelism of language that, you know, talks about different forms of death between humans and elephants in a kind of symmetrical way. Um, so that it's not taking, you know, the older uh, form of kind of, you know, again, centralizing human subjects as worthy of care and always assuming that, you know, the elephants are, are the problems or this revenge um, is always needed. Yeah, that certainly does happen. And um, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, there was a lot of use of fireworks, uh, sometimes even homemade dynamite. Um, and, you know, that's very, very dangerous. And so, yeah, definitely a lot of people think of uh, elephant attacks on humans, though, as kind of having some, having some basis. And, you know, these elephants can be living, you know, 60, 70 years. And so I was talking to a friend who said he came across uh, an elephant skeleton out in the forest, and he saw dozens of musket balls within in the bones. So this, you know, poor elephant had been shot with these muzzle loader guns for maybe decades. So just to think too that these are long term relations, long term encounters. And people know that, you know, we, we talk here about the elephant's memory, but um, people say that they often the elephants will um, recognize, you know, certain people, certain situations. Um, so I found that that interesting. Whereas in the, the uh, reading the biological accounts that was never mentioned. They didn't really talk about these, these forms of uh, The next part of his question is, how do fungi adapt to the cultivation of brand new hybrid or GMO plant species? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, they're always uh, adapting to different uh, crop species. I uh, once sat next to, uh, a uh, 
crop scientist on a plane who said that uh, we were just talking, she said that it was often assumed that once you have high levels of fertilizer in a crop, say like in the US Midwest with corn, that basically fungi totally, you know, like leave, leave the pitcher. And she said that's mostly true, but even in these highly um, cultivated kind of uh, uh, chemical fertilizer and pesticide rich environments, the fungi still find, find their own uh, niches. They're, so what was interesting to me was to think that they are constantly discovering new species. Like this is kind of what they've been doing for you know basically a billion years on the planet. And so it'll be interesting because like with a, uh, to a degree certain GMO modifications they're not necessarily built into this long-term or elements of it are not built into this long-term co-evolution with plants, but fungi are constantly finding uh, new forms of food. They're, they've been found in a, uh, in a landfill in Pakistan, uh, breaking down plastics that were thought to be non-decomposable. So they're looking for new foods and they're looking for new relationships. Um, it may be harder, it's, it's harder with more uh, chemical fertilizer, it may be harder with new novel DNA, but um, fungi will eventually do it, I'm convinced. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I, think, uh, I think we might have time for maybe two more questions. This is Sean Kennedy. Thanks very much for your speech today, Michael. Can you explain why elephants are such a strong cultural icon for India, whereas they aren't so much so for China? Is it just that there were always more in India? That's an interesting question. Uh, there certainly were more, and there are just way more. Uh, that would be a great question for Tom Troutman to answer in terms of uh, for India. It's really interesting with um, where they were discovered in China itself. It was the, the Dai Kingdom. And so when the People's Liberation Army soldiers came into the Dai Kingdom and present day Jinghong area, they found these kind of sacred elephants that the what one of the Dai leaders had kept and they actually brought them up to Beijing um, as a kind of like a, a tribute animal in a certain way. And over the long period of time, China, Chinese armies had sometimes captured these Southeast Asian armies that had sometimes hundreds of elephants in them. I mean, these elephants with armor and, you know, these incredible war elephants. And they, they brought them up north and they just discovered it was so incredibly hard to maintain them. This is, this is part of what helps uh, create that, uh, that cliche called the white elephant. But historically, the white elephant was something that, you know, these emperors in Southeast Asia would sometimes spend years trying to track down and, and find these rare ones. They were, you know, highly sacred, but they, were, they took a lot of work uh, to, to maintain. And so somehow, the, the Chinese empire never got fully enmeshed into this elephant culture. But I still, like I, 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 I disagree a bit with the kind of this, this war against animals thing. And there was an easy time in the 1950s when you know, Mao and other leaders could have just said, these are a pest, let them be gone. And they would have been gone. And so I find that there's, in, there's interesting uh, forms of relationships, uh, connections to the elephants that uh, that, that permeate society. And then um, this is going to be the, since it's already one, well, one less was from Tom Troutman. So I thought oh. I should read this one. <laughs> Behind Elvin was Wen Huangran's book on the histories of selected species of plants and animals, including elephants in China. Can you tell us about this writer as a pioneer environmental historian of China? Mm, yeah, well, I mean, Tom, Tom knows all this um, so well. I mean, I, I, it's, been, it's been a while, but just thinking about these kind of deep relationships of humans, of the movements of plants and animals and how humans have played a role in generating, you know, new kinds of varieties, new kinds of relations, new kinds of histories, that these are, are deep and complex. And so, Another person who I think of is uh, the kind of movement of the study of the movement of corn into Yunnan and how corn, by creating this high altitude crop that could grow so well, 
uh, like totally changed the lives and possibilities uh, for many of the different, you know, ethnic minority groups uh, throughout Yunnan. It, it just, these, these movements of crops, plants and animals have these huge reverberating consequences for, for many forms of life and, and different groups of people engage with them um, with more or less seriousness, but the consequences can be, can be quite substantial. I want to thank Michael for his really excellent talk, and I'm so sorry it's now after one, so we have to end at this point, but thank you for coming, and thank you, Michael, for participating, and we hope you'll be able to make our talk next week. Thank you. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.